Welcome to the Weekend University podcast, and this is your host, Niall McKeever. The Weekend University was set up to make the best psychology lectures available to the general public. To do this, we organize lecture days once per month, where attendees get a full day of talks from the UK's leading psychologists, authors, and university professors. Our podcast features in-depth interviews with our speakers, so you can learn more about their work. To keep updated on upcoming events and new lectures, you can sign up for the mailing list at theweekenduniversity.com. In this episode, we're joined by Jules Evans. Jules is the policy director at the Centre for the History of Emotions at Queen Mary University of London and a leading researcher into ecstatic experience. He runs the world's biggest philosophy club, the London Philosophy Club, which is over 6,000 members. His first book, Philosophy for Life and Other Dangerous Situations, explored how Greek philosophy, particularly Stoicism, inspired cognitive behavioural therapy. It was published in 19 countries and selected by Matthew Syed as a Times Book of the Year. His second book, The Art of Losing Control, explores the science of ecstasy and all the different ways people find ecstatic experiences in a post-religious culture. You can keep up to date with Jules' work on his website, philosophyforlife.org. Enjoy the show. So Jules, to get started, could you tell me how you would describe yourself to someone that's never met you before? <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I guess, I mean, in professional terms, I would say I'm a writer um, and I'm interested in um, ideas and practices which can help people um, in terms of uh, healing their healing difficult emotions or difficult experiences. Um, and I suppose, so I have a very practical focus in that I want to try and help people, particularly who like are just, you know, suffering from emotional or mental problems. But I, I've also got a bit of a kind of researcher, uh, scholar aspect to me. So I'm quite interested in ideas and practices from different eras and different cultures and how people use them and how they mutate and change over time. So I've both got a practical aspect to me, like, but then there's also just a bit of a kind of curious, nerdy side to me, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Those are the two kind of things I'm, I'm into, really. Cool. And your first book, was on philosophy, philosophy for life and other dangerous situations. Yeah. Why did you get so interested in philosophy at the start? Yeah, I didn't do philosophy at university. I, uh, I, I did a politics A-level and half of that back in the day was political philosophy. So I really got into that when I was about 16. And we had a great teacher, one of the best teachers uh, you know, of, my, of my education. And he just brought it to life. And I, knew, and I had a kind of capacity for it. So I was just very interested in ideas. And I was very interested in how ideas link together over history. So, you know, whenever I came across, when I was like 16, 17, if I came across like surrealism or something, I'd be like, oh, what's surrealism? And how does that fit into the history of ideas? And, and what about cubism? So I almost a bit like... Um, like a kind of Lego thing. I just wanted to fit in, you know, so I was always drawn to history of ideas. And um, I remember reading Isaiah Berlin. I don't know if you ever come across him, but he's a kind of famous historian of ideas from like, let's say the fifties and sixties. And I used to love his books, just these broad sweeping history of ideas. And I read like Bertrand Russell's history of philosophy. But so, I mean, I, I was always into that. I was always into ideas and the history of ideas. What got me particularly into it and into writing about it was, um, you know, that I, uh, I, I messed my, basically I, I kind of developed emotional problems when I was at university um, because, which I think were related to um, some bad drug experiences when I was uh, 18 and 19, uh, particularly, you know, a couple of bad trips on LSD, which I um, de dealt with uh, in classic English fashion in terms of not talking to anyone about it for years, bearing it. Um, so I developed at university, I developed social anxiety and, and post-traumatic stress and those kinds of problems. 
Um, so it suddenly it became no longer just an intellectual issue, but a critical issue, like to understand myself a bit better, uh, to understand my emotions a bit better. Um, and of course, I was very worried during those years that what was all, you know, all the problems that were affecting me, like panic attacks and dissociation and depression, was basically neurochemical and therefore beyond my control, and there was nothing I could do about it, and possibly permanent. Um, and basically, when I, by, by about 23, 24, I, I came to the realization that actually what was causing my suffering um, was my beliefs, uh, which were in my control. Um, and I'd, I'd initially come across that idea a little bit in philosophy, um, so it's just, it's just, it's just an idea that appears in a lot of different philosophical traditions. Um, uh, and then I, and I came across it as well in cognitive behavioral therapy. So basically that idea helped me a lot. It helped me to heal my emotions. And then in my mid twenties, I went to interview the people who, um, who first thought of cognitive behavioral therapy and discovered how much they'd been inspired by Greek philosophy. So, um, Cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the most um, common and evidence-based uh, talking therapy for emotional problems, um, it, it is basically directly inspired by Stoicism and ancient Greek philosophy. And it uses, I mean, it has the, the Stoics theory of the emotions, which is our emotions are connected to beliefs and judgments, and also all these Stoic techniques for changing your emotions, like self-questioning, like using a journal to understand your kind of automatic beliefs, like using um, maxims, to uh, the repetition and memorization of maxims to change your self-talk, like changing your emotions by changing your behavior. So I, 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 in my 20s, I came to this new understanding of Greek philosophy as this incredibly practical set of techniques and exercises which you can use to transform the self and transform the psyche. Much, much like Buddhism um, and other wisdom traditions, much like Taoism as well and, and, and Zen. Um, so, so that gave me, and, and, and then in my 20s, I really dived into ancient Greek culture and ancient Greek philosophy and found it, I, did, you know, I didn't speak or understand ancient Greek, so I just read it in translation, but these books were so alive to me and so beautiful, like stuff like, you know, Plato or Epictetus or, um, you know, uh, I mean, all of it. I, 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 I got just as into like ancient Greek comedy and ancient Greek tragedy. I mean, I just loved that whole culture. So, I mean, I got into it in my twenties really. And, and kind of, um, so, um, so yeah, just, it just came to life for me as soon as I, I and, and, and then I was just amazed that these ideas from 2,300 years ago were so effective today still. Um, and I thought that should be more widely known. Like, why didn't more people understand or uh, that, that cognitive behavioral therapy owed so much to ancient Greek philosophy? Um, and, and, that, and that Greek philosophy was so useful and practical. You know, sometimes when people would say, what's the point of philosophy? Or like, what's the point of the humanities? I'd be like, you know, <laughs> they're so healing. Uh, like, don't you realize that whenever you go to the GP with depression, you're using ancient Greek philosophy? I mean, like, you know, he's going to prescribe or she's going to prescribe ancient Greek philosophy to you. So I, you know, I became fascinated by that and how these ideas from ancient Greek philosophy are still alive in therapy and also in positive psychology and in various efforts to teach happiness or resilience. Um, and then in my... Uh, early 30s, I kind of, I, in uh, 2008, I started a blog. So I've been blogging for 10 years. Uh, and in that blog, I, 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 I interviewed psychologists about how they, you know, their, their kind of connection to Greek philosophy. And I also tracked down people who, who used Greek philosophy today in their lives. Um, whenever someone mentioned like, uh, a stoic philosopher and said that it had been helpful in their life, I would go, I would find them and interview them. So I, I started gathering all these stories of ordinary people who'd used Greek philosophy in their life. Um, you know, former gangsters or politician or sports people, whoever. And, um, 
And I, I met a guy um, called Eric Weigartz, who was this old, old American fella in San Diego. And he ran a online site called, it was then called the Stoic Registry to kind of, you know, bring modern Stoics together, which I thought was a hilarious idea. Like, you know, there, all, there, there was, and there's only about like 800 of them <laughs> in the world. But, uh, and so I, I, I did his, um, I, I, I edited his magazine. It was called the, the Registry Report. I did that for a, a year or two. And that helped me to meet some interesting modern Stoics. Um, and then, you know, I, I just started to kind of get more involved in the, in the revival of, of modern Stoicism. Like Eric and I organized a Stoic gathering in 2010, I think it was, in San Diego. And like there was only 10 people there. I mean, that was, you know, like, a, that was the height of it. Am I babbling on? Stop me, you know, like, I'm just telling you the, the, the story of my life. So tell me when to stop and, uh, you know. No, it seems, Jules, it seems that you started off by solving your own problem and then you got really interested in, in the subject and then because you kind of pursued that it's benefited a lot of other people in the process like your book was a massive bestseller and named time book times book of the year and it seems to have done a lot of good in the world too you know well yeah i mean like i think uh it's been part of a general rediscovery of stoicism um i mean there's been a there's been a few books around the same time this stuff still works, you know, this stuff's really valuable. And I think that's partly because more and more people realize the connection to cognitive behavioral therapy. So it's, I think Albert Ellis really is the great rediscoverer. Sorry, he is the psychologist who first developed cognitive behavioral therapy. Is it, is it, is it true you interviewed him on his deathbed? I did, yeah, in, in, in a hospital in New York. Yeah, the last interview he ever gave, um, you know, when he, and that was in 2007. But um, you, you must have been nervous before before that. That must have been a big thing, you know. It was a big thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, he was really ill. Uh, his wife basically agreed to the interview because he was in a dispute with his institute. They would kicked him off the board of the Albert Ellis Institute and refused to pay his medical bills because they fell out with his younger wife and thought she was going to take take over everything. So it was a horrible dispute. And so they really wanted to talk about that to get some international media attention. And I wrote about that a bit, but you know, I, I also just wanted to meet him and thank him and stuff. And it was, it was, it was great. It was the first big story I did about, you know, before that I was a business journalist. So this was the first big story I did about ideas and philosophy. And um, yeah, I mean, this was a guy who's had massive influence on my life. Uh, so it was great to meet him and write about him. Um, but yeah, so there's been this, this revival of, of, of stoicism, uh, and a few people have written about it. I mean, the same week that my book came out, um, Oliver Berkman's book, The Antidotes came out the same week and we both wrote about stoicism. We both interviewed Albert Ellis, you know, so there's quite a few similarities and there've been a few others. And, you know, I think we're all, I mean, like, yeah, that. I, I, saw, I get emails from people saying they've been really helped by my book. I got one yesterday from a guy I was at school with and his younger brother messed himself up on drugs as well. And, you know, they really, um, really went on a downward spiral, really fell out with his family and they gave him a copy of my book and, you know, says it really helps him and that their family's getting on much better and he's getting on much better. And that, those, those kind of emails, which I occasionally get, are, are, are so heartening. But, you know, like, I does, it, doesn't, it doesn't make me think I'm special. Uh, you know, the, I think the, the whole point of culture is to pass on the good stuff. Yeah. That is, a good culture passes on the good stuff uh, and keeps it alive and keeps people aware of it. And for a while, there was this, there was the well of ancient Greek wisdom got a bit grown over. And now it's, you know, there's, you know, thousands of animals gathering around the well. Um, and, 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 and there have been several books that have helped to, you know, and books and, and, and websites and all kinds of things that have, that have helped uh, revive, you know, these ideas. Um, so, um, I mean, I, so that's very, that's very nice to be part of that. 
And now I kind of watch the, now stoicism has become huge in the last few years. And I kind of watch, I'm, I'm not really a stoic anymore and I don't write about it that often. So I watch it with fascination, just the way it grows and mutates and changes. And then you get people using stoicism to become successful in business. And you get people using stoicism to get good at poker. <laughs> and you get, you get like white supremacists getting into stoicism and mutating it. So, you know, the, the, an idea grows and becomes se- successful, but it's never always just harmless either. And there's always misuses of it too. You see the same thing with this huge growth of Buddhism in the West, right? It can also be misused and, they, and there have been all these scandals in Buddhist communities, like sex scandals. And then there's a kind of mindfulness for, 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 you know, for capitalism or whatever. So it's very interesting, again, just to see how ideas mutate. But in general, I think the revival of Stoicism is a good thing um, because it's just giving people basic, basic tools for emotional intelligence. <clears throat> and it's particularly popular with men, which is great because men tend to run a mile from therapy but you know, call it stoicism and, and, and describe a few like gladiator metaphors and they're all into it. So I, I, think, I think that's good. A hundred percent. It seems like almost every idea or philosophy or technology even is a double-edged sword and it just depends on the people using it. But yeah, that's exactly er- right, yeah. Earlier you mentioned about maxims. Uh, in your, own, in your own life, what maxims have been most beneficial, particularly when you were struggling the most? What, what maxims were most uh, beneficial for getting you through the tough times? Well, um, I mean, right at, the, right at the beginning, the most useful were any, anything to do with, um, you, you know, accept the limit of your control, uh, focus your efforts on what you can control. So anything that, that, when I had social anxiety, that helped me remember, um, I can't control what other people think of me. I can control what I think of myself. Um, all, all, all that kind of stuff was hugely useful. Um, Cause you can just expend so much energy worrying about things that are beyond your control and really driving yourself crazy with it. And it was so refreshing to think, wait a second, I don't have to do that. You know, I can actually accept myself now just as I am. Um, so I think I, I, I think I was quite crippled by a perfectionism and, a, and a, very, a high idea of what my life should be and who I should be. And that was, and I, because I felt I wasn't meeting those high ideals, I was basically just really beating myself up and even like becoming, you know, almost suicidally depressed. So I was like, because I'm not meeting this, therefore I don't deserve to live. And then realizing, actually, I, there's, no sh- there's no must, there's no should. Like, you're just, you're in this life for a bit. Don't, no one really knows why. Why be cruel to yourself while you're here? Why not just relax and enjoy it, enjoy the mystery? So th- that was useful. And the other maxims, um, I mean, like, uh, in the last two years, uh this also will pass like that's quite useful like accepting the impermanence of things that can be quite useful um i in the last two years as well i i i've been practicing like love and kindness meditation so that's like wishing yourself well wishing other people well wishing wishing yourself you know, healing, wishing other people healing. So just that kind of the repetition of that, I think is quite good. It's, it's like the opposite of training yourself in hate speech. <laughs> you know, someone can be radicalized quite quickly yeah. through, through watching certain videos and getting in certain forums. They, they can become hate filled quite quickly. And, and the, 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 the silver lining to that cloud is it shows you can emotionally train people. And I think you could do the same thing uh, with, with friendliness or, 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 or warm-heartedness. You, you know, the repetition of just wishing people well will make you slightly more soft-hearted to people and less inclined to kind of 
hate them, really. Uh, and I think that's quite important in London because you can get really pissed off with people, with strangers in London, not to mention the people close to you. So, so that, kind of, that, that, that kind of repetition of love and kindness meditation, I think, has been, I think is quite, quite helpful. 100%. And you mentioned in your last talk with us about you set up sort of triggers in your environment to remind you of the important stuff and things that, are, that matter to you. Can you tell us a bit more about that there? Yeah. Well, I mean, I could show you. I'm, I'm, I'm in my flat now. Like, uh, so upstairs, I've got a kind of little corner, which is like a meditation corner where I meditate every morning. And I decided to make a shrine. Uh, and I made my own shrine. So I, <laughs> I printed out these pictures of various teachers. Uh, and I've got them in, you know, in the shrine. So I've got like Pema Chodron, who's a Tibetan nun, who I, who's like my, maybe my favorite living teacher. Uh, and a woman called Tenzin Palmo, who like grew up in Bethnal Green and then w went and became a Tibetan nun in India when she was 21 and meditated in a cave for 12 years. So she's an extraordinary woman. I've got Epictetus, the Stoic philosopher, uh, Thomas Traherne, an English mystic, Ram Das, <laughs> you know, and they're all sitting there smiling and it's encouraging. Like, you know, you meditate there and they're smiling on you and that gives you a kind of, you know, feeling of, yeah, keep on going, you know. Um, so, so that's one kind of reminder I have. I got some Tibetan prayer flags. You know those kind of coloured prayer flags? Do you know what I mean? I've never seen them, though. No. Well, they're, they're all over the place in northern India in Tibet. Each flag is, let's say, a foot wide and a foot long. And they're different colours, like red, yellow, green, blue. And they have prayers written on them. And Tibetans hang them up everywhere. And the idea is when they blow in the wind, they're kind of releasing just prayers in, into, the, into the atmosphere. So I've got one of them hanging up on my, on my balcony. And I, I really love that. Yeah, you know, I just see it kind of blowing in the wind and it's like, oh, that's nice, just giving away, giving away prayers. So that's another kind of reminder. And I have some maxims um, written out. I have um, the intentions that I wrote out um, before ayahuasca ceremonies i went to an ayahuasca retreat like a cliched hippie a year ago and um and before each retreat i would set an intention and i've got them stuck up on my wall like it's like open your heart and make friends with your fears or something like that so i i, I have them just like stuck up on the wall just to give myself that reminder as well um and then i have just um i'll have you know pictures around around the the house as well. I mean, this is a technique that, you know, Christians would use and, and Buddhists, which is just using art to give yourself reminders and to soak your imagination in the wisdom you're trying to embody. So I've got a, uh, a, a Buddhist uh, tanker uh, hanging on the wall and I've got a kind of um, Shipibo Indian ayahuasca uh, weaving on the wall as well. And this kind of stuff, you know, so this, so it's an environment which, you know, gives me little reminders, which I, which I completely need. It's almost like a, an external brain for you that feeds back into your, your own self-talk. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, you know, like people will wear beads around their hands as well. Uh, I mean, that's a classic old technique. So that, you know, if ever you, you're, you're, you're losing your mind a bit, you can just go back to counting your beads uh, and, and, and training yourself then. So uh, you could, you know, and you'll see like people who are very committed to, the, to a religious or spiritual path. You'll see them with their little Bibles or their little Qurans on the tube. So that, you know, at every moment they're giving themselves reminders. Um, yeah, people, you, I can see people use tattoos these days to try and remind themselves, don't they? Like, <laughs> I mean, it depends where you got it right. <laughs> like, uh, Anyway, yeah, so, so there's all, all these kinds of things. And, and like, you know, the ancient Greeks and Romans, they would, they would carry around little handbooks, which um, they called them enchiridions, so that when, when you were out in, you know, in the street or at work or at war, you had, and, and if you felt triggered with an old bad habit, you could read some of these maxims and strengthen yourself and arm yourself. And we've got, I mean, smartphones, perhaps, 
you know, perhaps we, we use them too much anyway. I don't know about you, but my, on the latest iPhone upgrade, it now tells you your screen time, your daily screen time. It's absolutely horrifying. But anyway, I've got some apps on my phone. I've got one called We Croak. And times a day, it sends you a reminder saying, uh, don't forget you're going to die. <laughs> <laughs> and and there's a there's a, a Burmese or a Bhutanese practice. I think it's Burmese, which says that if you remind yourself five times a day that you're going to die, that will help liberate you and bring you happiness. Um, and so you know that wherever I'll be, suddenly I'll get a ping and like, uh, yeah, you're going to die. <laughs> you know, so that's uh, that's another like these things. You know, I was reading. I'm reading a book from one of our speakers, a guy called Mick Cooper, who's like an existential therapist and philosopher too. Yeah. But one of the exercises he recommends doing in the book is to draw a line to represent your birth, to, to draw a line to represent your death and like kind of like a timeline in between. And then you yeah. mark an X on the spot where you think you are now. So say you're halfway there or a third of the way there. And I've, I did that and I've stuck it on, on the wall in my room and every day I see it yeah. and I'm reminded, yeah. well, holy shit, yeah. you're, you're nearly halfway there or whatever. And yeah, yeah. it's a reminder to to live life properly and not, not waste opportunities and waste chances, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm very interested in, in this idea um, that uh, I think Socrates said to philosophize, to learn how to die. Uh, and I've been interested in the idea because I turned 40 last year and it's got me thinking more about death uh, and whether one can prepare for death, what, you know, whether one should um, and, and for dying. Uh, and I've been to some retreats about that uh, in the last uh, year or so. So I went to a, a weekend retreat in the States with uh, someone called Roshi Joan Halifax uh, and a guy called Frank Ostaseski, both of whom run hospices uh, and work a lot with the dying and, and, and use Buddhist practices, particularly Zen practices, both to be with people who are dying uh, and maybe like freaking out and to be with them without getting reactive and getting triggered and shutting down. So they're practicing being open to like stuff that might be frightening or disgusting or terrifying or, uh, and just practicing being open with that. But they're also practicing being open, uh, open hearted and present where, when they themselves die. Um, and I've been watching a, an online course with Pema Chodron, who's now like 82, where she's going through the Tibetan book of the dying. Uh, or it's actually, well, it's actually the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Um, yeah, but it's the same kind of thing. Like, you know, when you're dying, it's a whole different, it's a whole reverse kind of way of seeing it. Like she says, like she had a teacher and he, he, he started dying and he was like, oh, great, here we go. <laughs> you know, like, because this is the moment of liberation. Like according to Tibetan Buddhism, that's a really important moment. And like, if you've trained for it and you're prepared for it, it's, you know, in the same way, if you were like coming up on a trip, you know, you could either go, oh my God, or you could go, here we go. <laughs> you know? So, and so that's interesting. And I, I so I, like I said, I did this, um, this ayahuasca retreat in October, you know, where you did five ceremonies and one of them, you know, I went, I came up really strong and I, and I went, I, I completely, I went to some place com completely beyond my usual ego consciousness and I couldn't remember my name or my body or my species I, all I knew is that oh I've gone too far and I don't think I'm going to come back you know and I, had, I didn't know where I was and 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 that's very interesting I mean and then and then and then I gradually remembered and I was like oh right I I, I yeah I remember my name's Jules and I'm a human oh yeah and I've taken ayahuasca oh yeah and I'm here to heal and then I was like Oh, and I've got this body. And then I was like, oh, right. And, 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 and then I was fine, you know. But, and I think that that's interesting in terms of practices for ego dissolution. Practicing your ego dissolving before you actually die, I think is quite useful. Because we've all got to go down that kind of water slide, as it were. And I'm sure it's going to be scary for all of us. But if you can practice, like, remembering so that you're like, oh, right, I'm dying. Oh, right, I'm dead. <laughs> you know, like, uh, and, and, you know, um, stabilizing your awareness and being open hearted, all of that stuff. I think all of that stuff is, is going to be helpful when we 
when we die? Because that's my, I mean, that's my working hypothesis is that, you know, we don't, it doesn't finish when we die, that that's just another transition. And the same tools that will help us now will also be helpful then. That's my, that's my hypothesis. Um, yeah. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. And I've heard, I've heard as well that death is the fear that lies behind 99% of other fears. So if you can come to terms with your own death and you're okay with it, then you're liberated in other areas of your life as well. So it can be probably very beneficial exercise to do. Uh, it is. Yeah. I think, um, uh, you know, it, 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 give, it can give one a lightness. Um, I think, I think also, I would say, you know, so, so much, so many of our problems come from um, worrying about ourselves, you know, particularly in the West, we have very developed egos um, and we, um, and, uh, uh, and, you know, it, it's our life's work, really, our egos, Try, trying to make these strong, good egos and these successful egos that are okay. And yet, and the worm inside that is we're all, like, always wondering, oh, but am I really okay? You know, uh, and, and so we just, we just, you know, put so much energy into self-construction uh, and there's so much anxiety around that and self-presentation. And, and I think, and it can be really liberating to think maybe that's just not that big a deal. Like, you know, maybe the game is not ego construction, ego protection, ego validation. Maybe that's just not important. Maybe, that, maybe that's an, an illusion and, an, an, and a delusion, which is causing our suffering. So, so beginning to lighten up, you know, to, to lighten your hold on the ego. I mean, you're still going to worry about yourself and how you're doing and your goals and what other people think of you, but you can like just not take it that seriously. So that's um, I, you know, anything that I think helps Westerners to like l loosen their grip on their selves a little bit and just relax a little bit, you know, not take themselves quite so seriously, I think is massively useful and helpful. Is is that why you are one of the reasons why you wrote your second book, The Art of Losing Control? Yeah. Uh, well, so the second book, I, I finished the first book and, um, it, and it was all about using Greek philosophy to heal yourself and using your reason to heal yourself. And by the end of it, I thought, um, well, I said, I did an, a kind of uh, an, an appendix and I said, you know, the Socratic or the rational path to well-being is just one path. And there is an alternative path, not the path of Socrates, but the path of Dionysus, not using rationality, but using kind of ecstasy, altered states of consciousness, not using self-control and self-knowledge, but using kind of surrender, um, losing control. Uh, so I, the second book was like, uh, a sister book to the first one. Uh, they're, they're these two sides of Greek culture, um, the rational Socratic and the Dionysiac ecstatic. And I was a bit inspired by um, a book by Nietzsche called The Birth of Tragedy, which is the first book he wrote. And I loved that book when I was like uh, at university. And he talks about these two forces, the Apollinean, which is all about limits and control, and the Dionysian, which is all about ecstasy and uh, transcendence and, uh, you know. So, um, so I wanted to tell that second side of the story. Um, so the second book um, was about how people find ecstasy today. How, um, what I mean by ecstasy is a moment where you go beyond your ordinary sense of ego and feel a connection to something greater than you. Um, and that can be, and most people think of ecstasy as meaning very happy. That's, that's not what it originally meant. It, it's a moment where you go outside of yourself and that can be euphoric, but can also be terrifying. Of course, like, you know, in, in the old Testament, it says is, it is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. So these moments of ecstasy, religious or otherwise can also be terrifying because like on my ayahuasca trip, you can go way beyond your ordinary self and think, my God, am I ever going to get back? Yeah. Am I going to go crazy? All that kind of stuff. So, um, the, and the, one of the reasons I wanted to write it was I felt a bit suffocated in British culture 
I felt the British culture was lacking, it was so skeptical and so secular that it, it had become lacking in transcendence. People, you know, it's amazing. What, people, you know, Nietzsche wondered, what happens when you kill God? And, and, and what's amazing about British culture is it, it, it appears people don't even miss God. They're not, they don't even think about it anymore. Like just, like, just get on with this life and your job and your family. And, you know, what are you up to? Oh, I'm doing a 5K run next month. Oh, that's cool. And how's your holiday? And, and that's it. There's, there's no, there's not even, people aren't even aware of what they're missing. The idea of, you know, like in the 19th century, there was this, or even in the early 20th century, there was this, oh, the death of God, what are we going to do instead? And now there's just, there's, people don't even, don't even miss it. There's just this flatness of life. Just, you know, this is enough. Just this, this, just the everyday, the little stuff. Strictly dancing, great British bake off, go to the pub, die. That's enough. You know, there's an incredible lack of, of ambition and, and questioning in our culture. And that, and that drives me crazy because I, like, um, I feel like I'm in a very stuffy room uh, and, and I want to kick in the wall to let in some air. So I was like trying to get British culture to think more about transcendence and the ecstatic and like the idea of something more than, you know, just the, 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 um, the mundane, um, you know, cause I, I mean, it's why I like your thing, the weekend university. I mean, you, it, it, it's rare. It's very rare to have a forum to talk about spirituality where it's not complete woo woo. You know, unfortunately it's either we have this very rational skeptic culture, um, or it's the new age where anything goes, uh, crystals, uh, you know, um, chakra pho photographs, anything. Um, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I like you, I'm interested in a middle ground where, you know, you're, it's, it's kind of a searching and an openness, but not an uncritical searching. And, and I, um, so I, I, I think Weekend University is, that's little places like that for me are like little bits of oxygen, you know, in a ground cave where the water's rising. And I'm like, I'm like, oh God, I'm sick of British culture. Ah, oh, but at least you can go to little places where at least, you know, where you can talk about spirituality without feeling like a freak. Yeah. So, so, so those kinds of things are important to me. Anyway, that's why I wrote the second book. Right. Okay. Um, I'd be curious to ask Jules over the years, you've had, you've had a few different ecstatic experiences that have been quite, uh, formative and quite beneficial for your own life. Are there any in particular that, that, uh, you would say have had the biggest impact? Well, you know, like the problem about writing about a book about the ecstatic on its own is it can lead to this, excessive focus on these amazing moments of ecstasy, right? Um, uh, and I think that was one of the problems with this, with my book, with my second book in a way, is that it can lead to a view of spirituality as being all about these, these peak moments. Um, and so I could tell you about peak moments I've had. And I did in my book, I talked about, I had a near death experience when I was like 24. I mean, that was, nothing else came, close. It was really life-saving. Um, and I've had interesting experiences on meditation and on psychedelics. But, and, and so when the book came out, people would say, name your top five moments of ecstasy, or what's the best route to ecstasy? And I found myself saying, oh, I, but, you know, it's not about that. <laughs> but of course, if you write a book all about ecstatic experiences, people are going to think, oh, why haven't I had ecstatic moments? Or could I have more ecstatic moments? Or how do I find an ecstatic moment? Um, so what I was trying to do in a way was like, um, get people over an aversion to ecstasy so that they're not afraid of it. So they're not of, afraid of moments where they go beyond their ordinary self. But the risk is people become then overly attached to ecstasy as well. So you see this sometimes in like say in, 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 in California, like in San Francisco, in, in that scene in San Francisco, very interesting scene and you would love it. 
because it's people who are on the one hand quite scientific and logical, but they're very into spirituality as well. And in, in San Francisco, that everyone's very into peak experiences. Everyone's very into ecstatic experiences. But it can become a kind of almost competitive spirituality where you're like, well, last week I did five MEO DMT and, uh, you know, I, I, um, all my hair fell out and, and, I, and I, you know, I got abducted by aliens. And someone else says, well, really, last, you know, last year I drank ayahuasca for a month and, uh, you know, I saw God and, and blah, you know, do you know what I mean? It becomes a kind of competitive thing. Um, I think now I feel like ecstatic experiences are something that happens in your spiritual life, but they're not the end of the spiritual life. They're just something that happens and they can easily be escapist. Um, you know, you're constantly seeking the next moment of ecstasy because you don't want to actually just sit with your loneliness or, yeah, yeah. or, or, or your, or your, or your vulnerability. So, um, and, and there's a risk, and you see that in, in Hindu culture, and you see that in Christian culture, of fetishizing moments of ecstasy. And so you say, ah, oh, there was that one moment under the, 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 uh, under the banyan tree when I, when I attained to Samadhi, or you know, there was that moment when I, you know, when I was walking the Camino de Santiago where God spoke to me. It was 3.57 on July the 15th, uh, and, and I knew that I was going to go to heaven or something like that. And, and I really like the, the Buddhist attitude to it, which is, you know, ordinary experiences or ecstatic experiences, they're all experiences. And any experience, you can get attached to it or averse to it. So like, even your most incredible ecstatic experience, it's just another movie. Like, it, it means no more or less than, you know, your boring experience reading the newspaper on the tube. They're all just experiences. They're all just as beautiful as each other. The most banal, boring experience can also be beautiful. Um, so it's more about your attitude to these experiences. Uh, don't be averse to them. Don't run away from them. But don't be attached to them. Don't go, oh my God, I'm so special because I, I, uh, I just saw an angel or you know, I just had a Kundalini awakening. These are all just experiences. It's, it, seems, it seems like... Was the original meaning of the word ecstasy to step outside your ordinary sense of self? And yeah. So it seems like the function of ecstasy almost is to give us an opportunity to step outside ourselves, have a more objective view of things. It's almost like a disc cleaner. And then after that there, it's up to us to, uh, this is where your second book comes in really well too, because then it's all about creating habits and actually the ordinary everyday experiences. That's the important stuff, you know? They're both, they're, yeah. I mean, it's all, it's all just experience. Um, but uh, yeah, absolutely. I think um, that, that there's, there's, you know, as, as many people have said, there's no point having a massive, amazing trip or vision if you just forget it. Uh, you know, these are all just glimpses beyond the ego. Um, but then, then you, you know, you, you've got to practice to stabilize it. So you know, in, in the 60s, the, the Houston Smith, the great theologian, would say, what matters are not altered states, but altered traits. So, you know, it's w many of my generation got so loved up on MDMA in the, in the early 90s. And it was, it was beautiful. It was wonderful. You know, it does, you could be very loved up on Saturday night, you know, and still be a bastard on Wednesday <laughs> morning, you know. <laughs> Um, so, um, so yeah, so, so, so exactly, as you say, the balance of the mundane and the ecstatic is important. Uh, you know, and Jack Cornfield writes the book after the ecstasy, the laundry. So you, you, you know, you've got to go back to the ordinary stuff and the, and the ordinary stuff is just as important and the ordinary practice and training, the daily boring training will really help you in the moments of ecstasy. And likewise, the moments of ecstasy will refresh you to help you to go back to the boring daily stuff. So they do feed each other. So along the life, you're gonna, you're gonna get unusual moments. And because it is a mystery, like we, you can forget this in the daily grind, but there's something extremely my mysterious we're, we're talking about, which is that, you know, our, fun, our, our, our strongly held um, model of reality is wrong. You know, that we have a, 
the ego is our ordering um, uh, idea for the whole of our reality. I don't, we don't really, you know, we, we can't even realize this so much at the moment, but you know, when we, when we're asleep, we dream our egos. When we're, when we're, when we're awake, we believe in our egos even more. Like, you know, this is the basic story of ourselves and we feel it so deeply that there's a me and that me is, is the most important thing in the universe. And, you know, the, the, everything we think about is connected to me. And then like a lot of these spiritual traditions or these wisdom traditions say that me doesn't exist like you think it exists. It doesn't really exist as a kind of permanent, real, eternal thing. It's more like, you know, like, a rainbow that you can kind of see, but it's kind of not really there. I mean, it's not like we don't exist, but like we just don't exist as we think we exist. So this is a wonderful, fascinating thing. You know, this is the kind of matrix aspect of spirituality that, you know, we're in a bit of a, an illusion that we've constructed and, and, and we're on a quest to wake up to that illusion. And that's very exciting. And that involves these wow moments of, oh, wait a second, this is, this is completely different to what I thought. And then it also involves just the, the daily sit and the kind of, oh, there's my mind racing around again, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But we shouldn't lose sight of that amazing mystery of what we're, of the, of the search that we're involved in. Because it's magical in a way. I mean, like, the reality is very different to how we think. And we can wake up to that. And the more we wake up to that, I think, I hope that that will be, make it more marvelous, you know, more wondrous, more exciting, more kind of glittering and dynamic, rather than just this dull, dark, narrow prison of the ego that we're sometimes in, you know, just going along, oh, I'm Jules again in my bloody life, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, it's, it's, it's opening the window a bit and more and more sunshine comes in. So that's exciting, you know. Yeah. 100%, 100%. Well, Jules, that's uh, pretty much all we've got time for today. All right. Uh, can you tell us what, you're, what are you working on right now? Have you got any new books coming up? What's your, what's your yeah. kind of focus at the minute? Um, well, I'm, I am um, putting together a collection of essays of, of, my, of stuff, some stuff that I've written, some stuff that I've never published uh, from the last two years. So since my second book came out, what I've been up to. So that, that involved me going to India for the first time and traveling around there for several months, going to the Amazon and trying ayahuasca, going to California and going to Burning Man. And it's a book um, partly about uh, turning 40 and the kind of anxious restlessness of, of that phase of my life and kind of coming to terms with that anxiousness or anxiety. Uh, and it's also a bit about spiritual tourism so uh, how we travel the world looking for practices and traditions and experiences and, and all the issues about that, you know, in this kind of globalized spirituality. So um, that's going to be out at the end of this year or the beginning of next. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to publish it. Like I'm going to send the, the manuscript to my agent and see if he thinks publishers will be interested in it and if not i'll probably self-publish it i don't know if i'm big shot enough yet for 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 publishers to want to publish my essays <laughs> maybe not we'll see but i'm really enjoying that uh, and so that's the first time i've ever <clears throat> really written at length about you know uh, my experience taking ayahuasca and so on so anyway that's what i'm working on at the moment uh, yeah it's really fun Great, great. Well, before we go, Jules, have you got any calls to action or any asks you'd like to ask of the audience listening to this? Oh, not really. I, I would just say, you know, I think it's, I think it's great what you're doing. I think I'm, 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 I'm really <clears throat> I'm interested <clears throat> in alternative models of higher education, which are not anti, which are not hostile to spirituality. Uh, and that's one of the things I've been researching. I'm really interested in places like Esalen in California, like the California Institute of Integral Studies. Have you ever come across that? Never, no. Okay, you should look into that. CIIS. Okay. Is because um, a lot of what the Weekend University does is explores transpersonal psychology, doesn't it? Yeah. It explores the science of spirituality, Jungian psychology, meditation. 
So a lot of what you explore is kind of transpersonal psychology. And, and, and that's the home of that is really California and particularly like Esalen and the California Institute of Integral Studies and also places like Schumacher College in, in, in Devon. Have you come across that? No. Oh, well, you, you know, it's, it's hilarious. So you're, your what you're building is quite similar to what these institutions are they're alternative models of higher education which are teaching psychology a psychology that's not hostile to spirituality which is exploring holistic growth um in a way that's open to things like spiritual experiences to things like the subconscious and so on um and you know that so there are these little experiments happening and some of them, you know, are very influential around the world. And, and I really like what you're doing. And, and, you know, you're not even aware of these other things. You just kind of, <laughs> you've just done them yourself, like, uh, you know, through, through a natural evolution. So, yeah, so I, 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 think it's, I think it's great what you're doing. And I, I would just, um, I'd just say, yeah, I'm, I, I, well done. You know, I think it's a, 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 a great thing. And I hope it really flourishes. Well, I appreciate that, Jules. And I appreciate you taking the time for the interview as well. So thanks again. And we'll speak soon. Sure. Yeah, nice one now. Nice to talk to you. Thanks for listening and I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget that you can win a three-month pass worth £150 to the Weekend University if you subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. And if you're interested in keeping up to date with new psychology lectures and upcoming events, you can sign up for the mailing list at theweekenduniversity.com.